Hi everyone and welcome to the Friday, January 28th installment of the Silicon Insider, the only uncensored look at life and business in the Valley. My name is Mike Malone and I'm here with special contributor Scott Budman of NBC Bay Area. Our producer is Jordan Henderson, our East Coast correspondent is Bob Grove, and our host as always is the Silicon Valley Business Journal. And a welcome to our new followers at the Sunnyvale Cupertino and Santa Clara chapter of the Silicon Valley Association of Realtors. Okay, Scott, bad week. This was a miserable week. Yeah, I think the question is, is it a one-off because of a few factors that we can get into? Or is this the end of the big tech run that we've seen in the last couple of years? I mean, the, er the early reports are brokers got up one morning and said... There are too many things going south right now. Why are we? Why do we have such a large position in the market, especially in tech stocks? That's a very good way of putting it. I think the position may have gotten a little frothy. Um, I mean, really, people bought a lot of tech, both yeah. the individual products, you know, phones, computers, all that stuff, but also the sort of back end stuff, the chips and a lot of software during the pandemic and continue. Uh, as people work from home, as schools need to make sure that kids have technology in their house. Right. But at some point, uh, and I think it was the earnings, you know, that started to say, hey, we're not as dependent on technology. We're starting to get out yeah. a little bit and we're starting to eat out and go to the movies. And we've seen how that hit the bottom line of some Silicon Valley companies. There's also seems to be, well, existing and growing inflation fear, but now I'm hearing talk that the Fed may raise interest rates not twice this year, but four times this year. Right. And wasn't that another reason that the overall market uh, went down? Yeah. The idea that, and we talked about this, I think, in last week's podcast, the last time we had inflation of any real kind was 19, what, 82, the early 80s. Right. And so by raising interest rates, you know, they brought about a recession and we right. had housing interest rates, mortgage rates that were super high. And uh, that really put the kibosh on a lot of the growth. And if you look at where the growth is here, it's in tech stocks, it's in housing. And I think a lot of people say, whoa, if you you know put the brakes on those things, where will the money come from? Putting the brakes on, and then we now have, you know, even the Fed's admitting inflation is real and dangerous. And then store shelves are still not stocked. And certain prices, like they're talking about $200 a gallon oil, uh, and then they're talking about price controls. I mean, I'm getting a lot of a lot of deja vu from 40 years ago. <laughs> it's like we need every generation we have to learn again how this whole process works. But you know, even in the, I mean, if you if you talk about that as speculative because it hasn't happened yet. Not yet. But look what has happened. I mean, Netflix. Uh, which has been a powerhouse for a long time, right. uh, literally is half of what it was stock price wise at the peak of the pandemic. And so, you know, the headlines were, whoa, it's like the pandemic didn't happen for Netflix. Well, sure it did. Yeah. And that's why its stock was $700 and a And they share. made a lot of dough. Absolutely. And I hope a lot of people took, you know, took their profits out. Right. But when the research showed, hey, people are starting to go to the movies again. They're starting to go on, you know, trips and even cruises and all those things right. that take you away from your couch. Um, that hit Netflix's bottom line. They're still growing, but they're growing more slowly than expected. And investors just bailed, uh, thinking, well, we had a huge run because of the pandemic. Now people are starting to get outside. And so that is a stock trading, not just on fundamentals, but on our behavior, which is so interesting. The culture is, is shifting back again. And we don't quite know how it's going to shift back. Right. I mean, it's, it's interesting. Literally, you can go from one state to the next or one school district to the next, and the rules are completely different right now. Right. I mean, the you know, there's there's an economic story to this pandemic, but there's also the social and political, and, and that still has yet to be written. Yes. I think it's happening as we speak, as and we you're speak, right. Yeah. You know, it was a fed. There are federal mandates, but then that goes to states, and then even counties, and even school districts, and it's fascinating it's it's very frustrating as someone who has kids in school yeah but it is fascinating to see how it's all playing out you know block to block almost uh well let's talk about a company that we talked about a lot a little bit a while back uh robin hood okay remember i mean yeah <laughs> yeah it's hard to forget uh the game stop short squeeze and all of that and the chaos and Robinhood stock was going through the roof. 
Well, now it's in big trouble. Yeah, you know, Robin Hood was sort of predicated on the way, on, on the idea, and a, a book was written about this, a very good one by Ben, ben Mesrick. I think it's going to yep. be made into a movie that, you know, that the people have the power that, you know, you and I, not Wall Street traders and, and, you know, hedge fund managers, but you and I can control the market or at least individual stocks by banding together on social media and deciding to buy and hold. And we'll do it on Robin Hood because it's a cheap way to trade. Right. Um, and the stocks benefited from that. I mean, AMC theaters made a lot of money that they could put back into their theaters. Uh, you know, GameStop. GameStop's still here. Right. It's I still mean... here because largely of the value of the stock and the attention that it got. But Robinhood, if you think about it, was just sort of a platform to right. allow you to do this. It was it, just a conduit. Right, that's a good way of putting it. It wasn't all that necessary. And so now that people aren't getting into the meme stocks, as we call them so much, right. what is Robinhood for? I can trade on a dozen different platforms. Yeah. Why do I need Robinhood? And and that's a question that um, well, it's even the company itself hasn't. It's answered. way below its its IPO price. That's not good for a company that's been around for a while. Uh, it anticipates first quarter revenues of less than three hundred and forty million. That's down thirty five percent compared with last year this time. And Wall Street expected four hundred and fifty million. So. Active, monthly active users fell to 17.3 million last quarter from almost 19 million in the third quarter. And um, the worst comps are yet to come because we're, now we're, gonna, we're heading into two quarters that will compare with the chaos of last year. Right. Robinhood is one of those companies that the bottom line is still the number of users. And, you know, so it's, it's, it's a bit like a, a Netflix in, in terms of subscribers. It needs that number. You know, same with a Twitter or an Instagram. But for Robinhood, it's still too new and too sexy, if you will, to be declining. It's yes. way too early to be declining. And that means people say, well, there is a risk to trading on Robinhood that there isn't on an E-Trade or other platforms. And that risk just isn't worth it. And that's the death knell very early for this company as a publicly traded company. It needs to shore up that risk reward ratio and become more than just a place where you can trade mean stocks. There just yeah. aren't enough of them. Yeah. Well, time will tell. I think by this summer we'll have a pretty good idea of the fate of Robin Hood. That's a, yeah, probably. Uh, let's talk about another high flyer, the highest flyer, Tesla. Uh, Tesla shares dropped 11% uh, this week. This was a big drop, and here's something that, that is Well, it said it's not going to produce any new model vehicles in 2022. Right. I mean, we've come to expect Tesla not to hit their deadlines, <laughs> but to announce there's no deadline this right. year. That's, that's kind of shocking, and it's not yet working on its follow-up $25,000 car. Right. Well, and they even took the date away from the um, the Cybertruck for those of you waiting for that. Yeah. <laughs> like that's no longer something you can put money on. And and here's an interesting thing: Tesla hit its numbers big time. They sold a record amount of cars, and that always excites investors. So to follow that up with, well, we're not going to make any more new cars. Yeah. And even Musk saying, well, robots are more important to our future than cars right Wasn't now. Wasn't that an interesting? Because everything he says is studied like ancient text right. you know it's like a it's like what does that really mean well when he talks about you know obscure cryptocurrencies or whatever i don't give that any sway yeah. but when he talks about the company that he's running that is a trillion dollar company or that was and that has a lot of investors and a lot of customers that's important and he goes eh, we're not gonna come out anything next year and oh by the way cars aren't that important right and, it's and, robots right and if you're an investor in a company that makes the great deal of its money from cars and zero of its money from robots you're thinking this might be a dry year profit wise yeah. now it still will sell a lot of model threes and y's and you're starting to see them literally all over the yeah. place uh so that's good it's good for the environment it's good for tesla's bottom line but this is a stock that is just such a high flyer and so for it to lose you know what when you're lose flying bucks that a day, high right you, there's no allowance for error right the market will not forgive you and Musk says it's a supply chain issue. And that's where we see in real time a supply chain hitting a company's bottom line. Yeah. Musk says we can't get the parts for the cyber truck. We can't get the parts 
that we need to lower the price to the point where we have a $25,000 car. That's real, and that affects the stock. As long as we're on Elon, <laughs> uh, did you see that story where this kid developed an app that would track Elon's plane wherever he was? Uh, and Elon turned around and offered the kid $5,000 to get to kill it. And the kid said, no, I want 50000 Isn't this blackmail? It is. And, I, and I try, I, 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 I've known Elon for a lot of years, and I know him fairly well. I was trying to think, what would be his reaction? His first reaction would be, well, that's a very clever thing to do. Then the second thing is, yeah, but I really don't want people to know where I am at every given moment. So let's pay the kid a little money and, you know, show him a little respect. And, you know, the word gets out. But then the kid comes back and says, no, I want 50 grand. Now it's suddenly a shakedown. Uh, what do you do next? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, Musk has a, an interesting relationship with privacy. On the one hand, hey, I'm all out there and I'm telling you my every thought. Yeah. But it is legitimate to say, I don't want someone tracking my every move. I'm a public figure. I'm very wealthy. This is dangerous. Yes. Um, I'm not a fan of, you know, the kind of story that wants to point out, say, where a CEO lives or something. Uh, the, the, the San Francisco Chronicle years ago published the location of all the CEOs of their homes in the Bay Area. And it became known as the kidnapper story because you literally had put every one of those people at risk. Right, and there is a history of that. Uh, Charles Jeschke, I believe, Adobe, yeah. Uh, yeah. you know, many, many years ago. So I, I don't know, uh, I mean, I, I don't know how this ends, but I, I hope it ends with the app taken down. I, I just get a little creeped out when, when people track other people. And what am I saying? We cover technology where everybody's tracked, but yeah. not on the level of every move by a jet and this that's, is being done by a teenager, too. Right. I mean, well, and that's why, okay, yeah, show him some respect and say, wow, you figured yeah. this out. But on the other hand... How would you like a job at Tesla? <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe so. Uh, well, the white knight this week, as you called him, Apple. Apple yeah. uh, sales grew over 11% over last year for this quarter. That means Apple unlike everybody else apparently, had a great Christmas. They really did. The, uh, you know, and this came out just on uh, on Thursday night. And the, I mean, White Knight, there, there's no better way to put it. I mean, everyone was wondering, are people buying things? Are consumers shopping? Uh, is the supply chain issue going to hit all of technology? It's kind of like the supply chain issue applied to everybody else. And the chip shortage well, that was, applied to everybody The first thing else. I saw when I saw those numbers was not that Apple had a great Christmas, but do they have like a secret supply chain? Are there are there phantom, you know, black painted ships crossing the Pacific that nobody knows about carrying, you know, iMacs and headphones? I mean, I don't get it. I don't either. I mean, I know that Apple is, you know, has long worked on its own products and it makes its yeah. own chips and does all that. So that explains some of it. But they're not that vertical. I know, I know. And uh, the numbers were just gigantic. Um, and maybe it's because it was Christmas. Remember, the Christmas sales were also supposed to be down a bit, both online and in stores, which was very understandable. Even those who have jobs are nervous because we're still in this pandemic. Well, making it even more impressive was Apple didn't really introduce anything that interesting. Right. I mean, so, it had a new phone. So are these were just people buying replacement Apple products for the ones they had? Is I mean, that a sufficiently large market? Well, let me ask, isn't that kind of how it's been for years? Oh, well, yeah. I mean, you yeah. know, well, slightly you're better right. Macs, you're absolutely right. There's slightly a... better iPhones, but essentially we're upgrading whatever we've yeah, had. Since the watch, there hasn't been anything fundamentally new. Right, and there was an update to the watch, but I don't yeah. think that set the world on no. fire. Uh, no, so it I, is essentially... I, don't remember, I, don't, I don't remember people lining up this time for anything. No, Apple didn't allow it. A lot of the stores yeah. were shut down briefly. You, you know, a lot of the the um, so you know the did... online world really saved the day for a lot of these companies. Online shopping and for shoppers who were nervous about you know I didn't want to go to a mall. Yeah, uh, you know it was easy to shop online. And this is a trillion dollar company that had revenues go up eleven percent. A three trillion dollar company. A three trillion dollar company. This is just mind boggling. Yeah, and I mean it really was impressive. Uh, given all the other factors. And, and again, it's almost like those oh, factors also apply to Also a down market. Else. Right. Uh, now, when the dot-com bubble burst, 
one company held up the market for a few weeks on its strength alone, and that was Intel. Intel came in to save the day. Do you think this announcement last night by Apple will provide sufficient buoyancy to hold up the market during this kind of bear period? Not necessarily, because even as Apple has come in with great numbers and its stock price is higher, the market and tech, especially the NASDAQ, is still bouncing around. Yeah. You know, this was the week of huge losses, but it was also a week of really big comebacks. We saw a couple of days where the Dow was down as much as, say, 900, 1,000 points yeah. and ended up positive. Yeah. I mean, that's a huge swing and vice versa, where you'd start well, then the Fed would say something and everybody well, would freak your out. Your favorite word, frothy. <laughs> <laughs> truly described describe the market this week. Yeah, and and yeah, it was a real roller coaster ride. Um, if if any company, and, and I think this is akin. Don't let me put words in your mouth. But when you say Intel, Intel wasn't just the strength; it was the stability, right? Back right, then, right. Apple maybe is the stability here uh, from keeping everything from falling. It's a huge component of the Nasdaq, obviously, but it's also a component of the Dow. Sure. Uh, so maybe its strength and stability gives investors pause to say, okay, we don't have to capitulate and throw everything out. We don't have to bail yet. Right, because people are still buying technology. They're buying laptops and they're buying phones. And that's good for all of those, you know, sort of app-based companies that rely on the phones. Well, we'll see. We should yeah. know. We should know by the end of the day today if, if Apple had any effect. Uh, bad way for crypto. Yeah. And crypto and has... yet I'm hearing uh, the Wall Street Journal this morning has a story how, well, I got one, I found it on a, uh, I, get a I get an email service from a guy that per, uh, uh, reports on the crypto market. And he says, despite all this stuff going on over here, all the bad stuff, the United States and Russia, I mean, the rumor last week was Russia was going to get out of, of right. crypto and make it illegal. Turns out they're looking at possibly using it as a major part of their economy. And the United States apparently is having is undergoing a study right now to see how it can incorporate crypto. So it's like bad short term news, potentially enormous long term news. Right. And crypto fans look at that and say, ah, you know, they're yeah. rubbing their hands together. Let's buy more on the dip. Um, but look, crypto is so crazily valued right now, even at 35,000, not to mention right. 70,000. I mean, how so, many times have we said this? Right. I, mean, right. I <laughs> no. can say this till I'm I mean, blue in the face. It's just insane. Right. And we have no idea the value of this thing yet. No. And so it's it's just too early other than to say, hey, yeah, bad week. Woof. A lot of people lost yeah, money. Woo. Are they sticking with it? Who knows? Who knows? Yeah. Uh, okay. This one was interesting. This is like boomers versus... Gen X. So Neil Young announces that it's between he, Spotify has to choose between him carrying its music, him, Spotify carrying Neil Young's music, right. or carrying Joe Rogan's podcast. And for as a boomer, I'm looking at going, well, of course you got to go with Neil Young because he's got <laughs> the bigger audience. Right. And then I saw the actual numbers per month, and Neil Young's like six million downloads. And Joe Rogan is 30 million downloads. Right. And as, okay, so I'm, I'm Gen X and I'm still a huge Neil Young fan. Yes. Um, I would venture to say that Neil Young has made more money from me buying concert tickets than he has from Spotify, which is notoriously sure. a low paying service. But uh, this was a great move. And I think, you know, let's put politics aside and right. the vaccine thing. But Neil Young speaking out makes him valid and relevant in a way, and I say this as a big fan, that he hasn't been in, you know, a couple a of decades. Time. Yeah. yeah. Um, and he's always been political. This is a perfect way to say, hey, I mean, okay, look. But he's always been Mr. Free Speech. He has, but at the same time, this is, and it's strange that it takes Neil Young, uh, you know, misinformation on the internet, misinformation yeah. on social media. Who's going to be the standard bearer? Neil Young? Yeah. I mean, Neil Young is like old, right? Well, I also thought as he announced it, I, I looked it up and I realized, wait a minute. It's not that hard for him to do it because he sold the rights to his music already. Well, right. He's really, really rich. He's really, really rich. And, and he's 71, six. 
at and least. I, and I, <laughs> yeah. I, and I think he's still Canadian. He's still <laughs> so. Look, they're all so. I mean, he owns all the I'm land. I'm wondering what and, the costs are to Neil to do this. And he owns a lot of real estate in the Bay Area. He's fine. <laughs> Neil Young's fine. Yeah, he's, he's fine. He owns now. all the hills above us. Which which makes it also a perfect move for him. I mean, remember some years back, I think it was about ten or eleven years ago. You know, Radiohead put its album online for free, yes. saying pay what you want. A brilliant move if you're already Radiohead and you live yeah, in a castle. Yeah, Radiohead and you're, yeah. some new bands playing in a bar. Right. Uh, and so Neil Young can afford to do this, but it's also, you know, I as a Gen Xer am waiting. I'm saying, wait a minute. So where's Pearl Jam? Where's Rage Against the Machine? Where are the bands that came up because of Neil Young as pissed off against the man? You know? Yes. And why aren't they fighting against Spotify as well. Well, our favorite communist anarchist band, uh, Rage Against the Machine, seems to be a little bit more commercial these days, <laughs> a well, little bit more capitalistic. But again, they've made their money. Yes. And you can criticize that or whatever, but they can afford to say, hey, here's a real stand right. for, I don't know, health, for true info, you know, truth on the internet. So what do you think of Spotify's reaction to this? Well, you know, Spotify said, okay, Neil, Bye. Right. Um, I, I'm not surprised by that. I think this was a Neil Young move. Yeah. Uh, Spotify, uh, you know, would really have been interesting if they said, hey, Rogan's podcasts are dangerous yeah. and they're causing people to get sick and maybe die. Let's pull the plug on our, what, $100 million investment? Right. That would be a big surprise. It wasn't like Neil Young and Joe Rogan have anything in common in terms of money made, relevance, you know, importance to Spotify. Audience. Right. But now Neil Young, I mean, Apple already came out, you know, with a thing saying, hey, we're the home of Neil Young. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't exactly the message they were yeah. doing back when U2 was, you know, right. with the shadow ads. and Neil you know, Young who? Exactly. But now Apple is the home of Neil Young. I love this. This is my favorite story of the week. And Spotify is, uh, who knows what the numbers will be, but the last day and a half of the delete Spotify hashtag on Twitter, I checked. Spotify has a message up saying we're seeing so much traffic it may take a while to do what it is you want to do if that is delete Spotify yeah. and I wonder if that means a lot of people are doing it and um, which which again you're deleting Spotify because of Neil Young this yeah. is really surprising how to often me. do you listen to cowgirl in the sand in 2022 <laughs> right um, but it, it's I was actually listening when the music stopped I was like are they really gonna pull Neil Young so I'm listening, I believe it was after the Gold Rush, perhaps my all-time favorite album, yeah. and it just stopped. And wow. I thought, whoa, that's interesting. They really did pull the plug on a major artist um, in order to keep Joe Rogan and his misinformation going. Let's see if, well, I think I heard Barry Manilow today showed solitary. <laughs> Is he pulling his music yeah, from Spotify? I'm not sure, but I, I'm curious how many other artists will like Right, that's what artists. I want to know. And is it going to be anyone of the size of, say, you know, a Drake or a Taylor Swift or anyone who can really make a difference for young people? Uh, uh, yeah, you know, I think there's a, there's a movement right now to get Taylor Swift to quit. Well, and that would be a big, big thing. I mean, yeah, you know, I've got teenagers. They love Spotify. They love right. streaming music. If Taylor Swift or Beyonce or Drake did something, they'd listen. Yeah. Uh, Neil Young is not going to get the young people to say, "Hell yeah, I'm against Spotify." That's more my age and, and you know. Yeah, that's just a bunch of people up in Mendocino <laughs> going, "Yeah, Neil." <laughs> but, right. <laughs> uh, but hey, this is interesting, and it's um, it's somebody fighting back, and all of a sudden becoming relevant for the yeah. first time in a long time, and that's fascinating. Um, okay. Next, Intel. You know, Intel's been throwing a lot of money around building these fabs and everything, like the one they're talking about in Ohio. Well, it looks like they're going to have a little more money to do it. Uh, the uh, EU court, European Union court, has decided to overturn the uh, $1.2 billion antitrust fine that was levied uh, by the European Commission on Intel back in, uh, I think, 2002. So it, it, I wonder if this is a, it might be a turn. I mean, what, I spent a lot of time in England at, for the first 20 years of this century. And uh, everybody over there really is anti-American big technology companies. They almost spit when they say it. And it's, it's like, we will do anything to stop their hegemony and protect European interests. Now, all of a sudden, a court 
This was like one of the biggest fines ever on a tech company. And now the court, a court has said, nope, vacate the ruling, throw it out. Intel, you get your money back. Yeah, I mean, my guess is this is kind of a one-off and Intel wins, but the EU is still going to look very, very harshly at tech companies. That's oh, just yeah. what well, it does. Well, the consumer electronics, oh, yeah. But it's why Intel? Because the chip shortage in the world? That may be it, yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. let Intel grow because if it grows, we at least get the chips and we the devices we need. At least get the chips we, need, we yeah. can build our own consumer stuff. Yeah. Okay. And then finally, uh, remember the DM Association? Did that was like his third name or something yeah, right now. Yeah. Ever, yeah. And th so this was Mark Zuckerberg's attempt to not only control social networking and, you know. To seize the day, if you will. To seize, to seize cryptocurrency. Right. I mean, it's a very Bill Gates kind of move, you know, back in the day. Uh, well, apparently it didn't work. <laughs> it's for sale. Uh, or it's considering a sale, according to Bloomberg. Uh, DM is reportedly in talks now with investment bankers about next steps, including how to sell its intellectual property. It, basically, they're they're selling out. It's a fire sale. All inventory must go. Remember, this was of all companies, Facebook saying, "What we'd like to do now is be a home for your cryptocurrency." <laughs> yeah. Which is two things. Interesting for two reasons. One. Uh, a successful brokerage for crypto these days is run by who? The Winklevoss brothers. Yes. It all comes back. It to all them. comes back. It all goes, <laughs> goes all the way back to college. Mark is still ticked off at those two <laughs> handsome full men. full circle. <laughs> at those rowers. Um, but also, of all companies and of all things, yeah. you know, crypto owners are fighting back against big government and big size. They can't possibly like Facebook. Facebook yeah. has proven time and time again it can't be trusted. Right. Now it wants to be a place for currency. It just wasn't a good marriage at all. It can't be trusted. It can't be trusted with your kids. And it, uh, <laughs> right. It, it's this was good that it stopped before it started because it would have been a disaster. But you, but you know, it's also a reminder that big companies with a lot of cash laying around will pursue these initiatives, and the news first comes out, and you're going, "Oh my God, this." This giant companies rolling into this new market and they're going to take it over while it's still young and healthy and all that. And you look at Facebook, I mean, Instagram, sure. WhatsApp, buying up these things. And yet most big companies, they are constitutionally unable <laughs> to do startups. To do to to do entrepreneurship. Right. Well, that's why they buy them instead of create. That's why they buy them because they. Something happens in the course of the decision-making process. Frankly, I helped on a book on, on this stuff. There is the internal immune system of large corporations where no matter how many flags and flyovers they do announcing this new venture, everybody in the company is trying to kill it. They don't want, they don't want people from the company to go over and get rich in this startup. They don't want to take it away from their resources for their projects. The immune system swarms. And it's never obvious. The, the, the new startup never notices the, the knives in its back until it just falls down dead. Right, but also tech is dealing with more than anything, I would say, even larger than the supply chain issue, larger than inflation, is a huge trust problem. I yes. mean, a gigantic trust problem. And that affects not just those of us who have used technology for a long time, but those coming up saying, is technology going to be my life? I can't trust this stuff. Yes. And that's a real, real knife in the back. And so for of all companies, and I Facebook, think this began when Facebook was still not the dark lord. Right. You know, right. and, and it's just a hot new industry and it's like, wow. And the stuff always gets announced in banner headlines because you think it's going to change the world. And then the story of his death ends up on the fourth page of the business section. Yeah, I mean, you know, and there's even, you know, the casual linkage, let's say, of Square, which is now called Block, right, uh, and Twitter because of Jack Dorsey. And Square is saying, hey, we can be a trustworthy place for your crypto, and we're going to have these accounts, and we're about money exchange, and we do it right. well. We're trustworthy. But Jack had to leave Twitter to stop that political association, I yes, think. Yes, yeah. And so he did, and now Square, which is Block, <laughs> Um, can and go and, around and, doing and, and Square slash Block built customer trust. Yes. 
you know, you felt that that transaction was going to go through, it was going to happen nicely, and everything was going to go perfect. Right. They Facebook built is that up. They built up goodwill. I, I think Facebook has spent the last three years squandering all this goodwill. Absolutely. Okay. Well, that's it. Uh, let me get out the last page of my notes. Uh, that's it for now, folks. You can find us on the Silicon Valley Business Journal homepage as well as on Spotify, Anchor, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, and LinkedIn. Have a great weekend. Go Niners. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye.